Welcome to the Luke Nasia Show. I have a different setting because I'm just traveling across Texas for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And as a result of that travel, just had to find a place that the production team could get together and we could film the show. Sometimes I try to record a show beforehand, but honestly, there's so many things going on that to have my show as up to date as possible for each and every one of you, I've just got to have a flexible production team that's willing to find me where in Texas I end up being and then help bring this show to you. So thank you to the Texas Scorecard team for accommodating my travel schedule. Also, by the way, I will come to places across Texas between now and the end of the year and talk about uh, the future of the legislature, the Republican Party, where we're going. So if that's something you want me to do, please reach out to me. I'm trying not to do a lot of that during the summer. There are a couple events in July, uh, but for the most part, start to line up some key conversations in the fall. Guys, I'm gonna talk about two things today. The race for Speaker of the Texas House, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, but I'm gonna talk about the most important thing that happened on Friday and has had kind of a ripple effect throughout the weekend. And then really gonna break down the Texas GOP convention because last week I had to talk about the runoffs even though we had just completed the convention. So I'm gonna break down all of the things that conservatives accomplished at convention by coming together and actually coalescing around policy and a joint vision and not personalities. And the refusal to engage in that led to some really strong victories. Let's get to the show. Dade Phelan got reelected. All of you know that. You also know that he won by 336 votes and well over 2,000 Democrats voted in his Republican primary runoff election. Essentially, they came out to deliver a victory to a speaker who has empowered Democrats, right? And this is one reason why at the Texas GOP convention, we're gonna to get to in a second, we actually passed a rule to close the GOP primary. And I'm also gonna to explain to you what that even means. There were a ton of questions at convention about, hey, what does it mean to close the primary by party rule? How does that work? So I'm gonna walk you through kind of a bird's eye view perspective of what that looks like. But Democrats showed up and they reelected Dave Phelan, which is apropos when you consider the fact that he literally places all of these Democrats in the powerful positions as committee chairs. He gives them leverage. He voluntarily gives them leverage to be able to then kill policy and punish conservative lawmakers. So on Friday, 46 Republicans, and that is a combination of both sitting Republican members and incoming conservative members that were just elected, okay? So incoming Republican members and sitting members, in combination, 46 of them signed a letter saying that they are only going to vote for a speaker who is going to stop empowering Democrats with powerful chairmanships and they're gonna do it in the Republican caucus. Two important things. What does this mean? It means that a majority of the Republican caucus in the legislature is saying they do not support Dade Phelan's leadership. That's what it means. It's very easy to understand. And I was talking to some people over the weekend and a couple of them said, well, we don't really know where Dade Phelan stands on the issue of Democrat chairs. Uh, that's not true. We know exactly where Dade Phelan stands on the issue of Democrat chairs. He supports them. He even doubled down to support them like six weeks ago or eight weeks ago on television. They said, you keep appointing Democrat chairs. You've been criticized for appointing Democrat chairs. Are you gonna continue that practice? He said, absolutely, I'm gonna continue that practice. So Dave Phelan knows exactly what he's doing and he knows what his position is on that issue. So when these members sign this letter saying we oppose any speaker who's gonna empower Democrats, also two of the people that signed that letter were Shelby Slauson and Tom Oliverson, two individuals who have announced that they are running against Dave Phelan. So you have very clear opposition that he is dealing with from a majority of the Republicans who will be in the caucus, okay? What does that mean? It means that what Dave Phelan has done privately, he's now gonna have to do publicly. Because in the past, what he would do is he would work all these members, but at some point, Democrats would come over and support him. And he'd get 15 to 20 to 25 Democrats. And then they'd start calling Republicans in the caucus saying, hey, these Democrats are gonna support Dade too. And all of a sudden the Republicans who were there were like, okay, well, I should sign on to support Dade because he's got Democrats, he's got Republicans, he's probably gonna win. And I don't wanna be on the losing team. I wanna have good committee assignments and they'd sign up to support his campaign. 
And then you come out and have a press conference before the caucus ever met and say, the race for speaker is over. I have the votes. Well, now he's in a problematic situation because a majority of the Republicans are saying, we don't support this guy. So now he has to basically say, I'm not going to get the nomination. He got the nomination the first two times. Now, he walked into the caucus meeting. The caucus meeting is held in December. Okay, The election's in November. Then there's a caucus meeting in December. And in December, all the newly elected members, so if you're a newly elected member that won in March or May, you're going to win in November for the almost all of them probably, but there might be one or two that don't. But for the ones that do win in November, I actually think our majority is going to grow in November. I'll get to that maybe in a later episode this summer. Talk about the key competitive districts in Texas, what matters, and why I think we're going to grow the Republican majority in the Texas House, maybe the Texas Senate, and our congressional delegation, and what the path is to get there. But we'll do that later. Okay, so they get elected in November, and then in December they come in, and this is the first caucus meeting for most of these, all of the newly elected members. This is their first caucus meeting. They walk in, and they select their caucus choice for speaker. And to get the speaker vote, I think it's going to take 52 votes. It's three-fifths of the Republicans, 86 Republicans, three-fifths, which means that 35 Republicans can essentially block somebody. So if 35 Republicans say we're not supporting them, they can prevent anybody from getting the nomination. And so what hap this is designed to build consensus. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to be happy, but it does mean that Republicans are going to be more united than not on the issue of who their speaker should be. And now you have 46 Republicans who have said, we are not with Dave Phelan. And so the response from individuals who haven't signed is just interesting to see. And a lot of it's all private. You have all these calls going on and you have activists. I know activists who have called member, their members of the legislature who haven't signed on this letter. And they're being told, we have to focus on November. The race for speaker is not really going on right now. It's anything but substantively defending Dade Phelan. And at this point, they can't say, well, he's going to be supported by Republicans. So it's very clear that if Dade Phelan wants to remain speaker, his only path is to say, I have the Democrats with me and I only need 11 Republicans. I only need 12 Republicans. Will he do that? I don't know. But 46 Republicans signing that letter was a great action by all of those members, okay? Doesn't mean I always agree with every person who signed onto that letter. But it does mean that that individual action who signed that letter was the right thing to do. So if your state representative is on that letter, you should thank them, every single one of them. You should thank them and say, thank you for making it clear. This is a, a, a low entry bar. Thank you for making it clear that you're gonna choose a Republican speaker selected by Republicans. And then if they're not on the letter, call them and say, why are you, are you planning on cutting a deal with Democrats? Or is that on the table for you? That's what you have to ask them. Because it's not that if you haven't signed the letter, you're going to cut a deal with Democrats. It's that you think that might be a possibility. And it shows that you haven't made the paradigm shift to where the Republican caucus is on this issue. So I think that's an important conversation for us to have over the next six months. Let's get to the Texas GOP convention. The Republican State Convention technically starts um, on Wednesday, Thursday, but for many, it starts on Monday. And you get down there uh, knowing that the election for chair is gonna happen on Friday. Most everything's kicking off Thursday and the national stuff is gonna happen on Saturday, okay? But on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, committees are meeting regarding the rules of the Texas GOP the platform that the Texas GOP will have, which is the policy principles and values and worldview that governs our party. It's our compass. And then the legislative priorities that we have. Now, all of these are important. I'm going to break them down for you. We haven't had the legislative priorities produced, but what the committee does is the committee breaks down a ton of different legislative priority potentials, presents a list to the floor, and then the floor votes for the legislative priorities. So the floor then votes to say, these are my legislative priorities, what I would like to be in the top. I can't remember whether it's eight or 10 right now. And this sounds bad because if you'd asked me during the convention, I'd have told you it's eight or it's 10. I think it's eight. Um, and then the top eight that are voted on end up being the legislative priorities of the Republican Party of Texas. So 
Remember the Texas House cast thousands of votes every single session. And all we're saying is on those thousands of votes that you cast, can you make sure that eight of them are these? And then you can pass whatever else you want. You have tons of other stuff you're gonna prioritize, but eight of your several thousand votes should be these eight. We make it really simple. And the Texas Senate in the past has basically said nearly all of those legislative priorities get voted on almost every session, okay? So we know that the Texas Senate is very responsive to what these legislative priorities are, while the Texas House has in the past been very antagonistic to it. Um, and all the, the grassroots people are there. This is the sausage making process of the Republican Party of Texas. And so there are activists there every single day that are literally meeting with members of each committee, asking them, please put this issue in as a legislative priority and word it this way. And so that we can, that can be reflected in the bill that we want to become law. So the legislative priorities are getting set while the platform's getting set. Now the platform is different. The platform is an all encompassing document that has tons of different positions on tons of different issues, right? And it's a really important document that holds Republicans accountable to what it means to be a Republican. And this is what to say, like if you read this document, you will go, yeah, this is not a libertarian document. This is not a liberal document. This is not an independent document. This is a document that reflects a broadly based conservative policy and cultural position for the party in Texas, the Republican Party of Texas, right? There are pushes every year to water this down. And literally since my first convention at 16 years old, there's been pushes to say, hey, let's, let's make the platform simple. It needs to be easy to consume. The average person should be able to pull up a couple pages and say, this is what Republicans believe and I'm a Republican. But that's not what it's meant to do. It's meant as an encyclopedia of sorts that basically gives you a good and solid foundation to say, this is what it means to be a Republican. That's what it's designed to be. And that's what it is. And the platform committee work tirelessly to look at every single section. They break up in subcommittees and then there's people handling the foreign policy issues and the immigration issues and the education issues and all the things. So they worked on the platform, did a great job. We have a great document as a platform for the Republican Party of Texas. And then the rules. And this is what I'm gonna get into closing our Texas primary. So two years ago, uh, we moved to remove state law from our rules, the rules that govern the Republican Party of Texas. And that was a very important move. And actually, Steve Armbrister from Williamson County, the old Williamson County GOP chair, who's now been replaced with a stalwart conservative, Michelle Evans. But Steve Armbrister and several of the more moderate faction in the GOP literally tried to like disrupt the entire convention two years ago to the point that they wanted to delay to the point that we were shut down and had to leave the convention without passing rules. Because if we don't pass rules, we revert back to the old rules. And they were so scared that we took state code out of our rules that they wanted to literally foil the whole convention, okay? And luckily the convention said, you're not doing that. And we moved forward and passed strong rules and a strong platform and strong legislative priorities. So fast forward to this uh, convention and Matt Rinaldi, this is really probably the crowning achievement of his time as chair. If you didn't listen to the conversation we had a couple weeks ago with Matt Rinaldi, I would encourage you to go back and do that. Even if you're a delegate and you haven't heard it, just go back and listen to it. You're going to hear from him uh, an articulation of what the Republican Party has been. And that's gonna be key when we get to the Texas GOP chair race, which I will talk about in just a minute. So one of his crowning achievements is that Matt Rinaldi formed a committee even before the convention started and said, I want these people to start having a conversation about closing the GOP primaries. We must end the practice of Democrats coming in to elect the most liberal Republican on the ballot. And they do so. They definitely did it in Morgan Myers' instance in Highland Park. They definitely did it in the instance of Dade Phelan. Uh, they could have potentially done it in the instance of uh, Pam Little or uh, Gary Van Deaver. And so, I haven't looked at the data in depth on those two. That's why I say they definitely could have based on how close the Jamie Coleman, Pam Little race was. Uh, it, it is very highly potential that Democrats swayed that race. And then um, the Gary Van Deaver one, I don't know that it is the sole factor, but it is definitely a factor to the margin that Gary Van Deaver won by. And again, we'll have to look at the actual data of what it says. The ones I can tell you about are Morgan Meyer and Dade Phelan. And we don't want Democrats coming in. Many of the 
liberal incumbents that will hold on by one or 200 or 300 or 400 votes are often elected through Democrats coming in and selecting them as the Republican who they want to represent that area. But these are Democrats saying which Republican they wanna be on the Republican ticket, which they're gonna vote against, right? So here's what the Republican Party of Texas did. They passed a rule that said, we are going to close our primaries and stop Democrats from participating. Now, this has been a push for a long time and people think that the only way to do this is through code, through state law, through a bill passing the Texas House, passing the Texas Senate, probably starting in the Senate, then going to the House, then going to the governor, getting signed and closing the primary. And that's not how we're talking about doing it in Texas. Are you worried about your kid's future? You should be. I'm Charles Bland with Texas Tomorrow. This is a show where we're gonna talk about the issues and the people that are pushing the policies that concern your family, your home, and your kids. Catch Texas Tomorrow every Thursday. In order for me to tell you how we're gonna do it in Texas, I'm gonna go back to an example that Matt Rinaldi used when he was on our show, the Republican Party of Idaho. They closed their primary. The party passed a rule that said, we are not letting Democrats vote in our primary. And then the governor of Idaho, who's a Republican, sued the Republican Party of Idaho and said, no, you are gonna let Democrats vote in your race. Because I guess he wanted Democrats to vote in the election. They win in the federal court system because what the federal courts ruled was that the Republican Party of Idaho is not a government entity. It's a private association of individuals who are getting together. So they can determine who can and cannot participate in the selection process of which Republicans represent their party on the ballot. That's the simple thing to understand. That's the core is that this is a private association, not a government entity. So a government can't make it illegal for this private association to determine how they select. Okay, now it's nuanced in that either North Carolina or South Carolina, the court system ruled in favor of the state and over the party. I think it was North Carolina, but I might be wrong. Either North or South Carolina. And so that party, the, the reason for that ruling though, when you break it down, is that they said that state law allowed for the selection of Republican nominees either through an open primary where anybody can vote or through the Republican convention in North Carolina. So state law basically gave them a way to ensure that Democrats were not participating in the process by saying the only, the, we're gonna select our governor and our state rep and our state senator, and our congressman at the convention of the Republican party. Now, uh, I will tell you right now, Dade Phelan and all of his liberal rhinos would freak out if we said we're gonna select the Republican nominees at the convention. Um, that's not what the Texas GOP is proposing. The Texas GOP is proposing a closed primary. The reason I talk about the Carolina ruling is because we're not even allowed, like state law doesn't say the Texas GOP shall select, can select in either an open primary or the convention. It doesn't give the Republican party a single remedy to prevent Democrats from voting in their primary. Okay, which is why we believe that it's probably more in line with the ruling that was made in Idaho. So what happens if we go to court and the courts rule that the Texas GOP may close its primary, okay? Well, currently you don't register as a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, okay? Florida has closed primaries and you register as a Republican, a Democrat or an independent. And if when you register, you check the box, I'm a Republican, you can now participate in the Republican primary. If Dade Phelan and his uniparty buddies say, we're gonna refuse to pass a bill to close the primaries, then likely there will have to be some way of determining if you're a Republican. So it could be if you voted in a Republican primary in the past, the Republican Party of Texas is going to consider that person a Republican, okay? They're gonna consider that person a Republican. And then there would probably be a way for new individuals that come in to then declare their loyalty to the Republican Party and participate in the primary process. Now this is if the legislature digs its heels in and says, we want you to fail, which they might do. They might literally dig their heels in and say, we want you to fail. Even if the federal court system is gonna say, you can close the primary, we wanna punish the party for keeping Democrats out of the primary process. So to punish them, we're going to be as obstinate as possible. And we have to be ready for that being a reality, right? I do think it's important to talk about how simple this would be. If the legislature, if, if the Republican Party of Texas wins in the court system, 
and I'm trying to, let me slow this down so I don't get going in four different sentences that don't ever complete each other. If the Republican Party of Texas wins in the court systems and then we, it's determined that we can close our primary with or without a state law, the easiest thing for the legislature to do at that point is to pass a law that allows for partisan registration so that anybody who's coming in that has never voted in a primary can simply register as a Republican and then can participate in the primary process. That would be the easiest thing to do, right? If they say, no, we want to be obstinate, we don't want to work with the Republican Party of Texas to close the Texas GOP primary and prevent Democrats from voting in the primary process, we can still close it. We still have the authority to. That is the belief of the convention, of the rules committee, of the past chairman, Matt Rinaldi, and the sitting chairman, Abraham George, okay? And the way this would look is that you're still participating in a, in a regular election process, but in that process, there's limits of who is allowed to participate. You can't just walk in and say, I'm registered to vote, therefore I wanna vote for my Republican state representative. That is a good thing. There are some details to work out between now and then, but we have taken a great step in the right direction. And the delegates understand that we need to do this. The SREC understand we need to do this. Our chair and our vice chair and the rules committee understand we need to do this. And so we've put Texas on a great path in passing that closed primary rule. And in closing, we'll talk about the Texas GOP chair race. Now, I wanna start by saying this. I'm gonna talk about kind of how the GOP chair race happened, what it started as and how it ended. But I wanna emphasize something very important before, is that regardless of what side any individual delegate was on, or candidate for that matter, we can continue to work together, okay? So when I go through a descriptive process of the Texas GOP chair race, I'm not saying that if you were on the wrong side of the GOP chair race, you're somehow not gonna participate in making the party a great conservative institution for the next two years. That's not true. But I do think it's important for all of you to know exactly how it went down and the importance of the signal that it sends that Abraham George won. Abraham George jumped in the race. He's a former SRUC member, a former Collin County GOP chair. He ran for state representative against Candy Noble. So he has experience in the statewide party. He has run his own actual party, raised money and helped run an entity with the CEC, which is kind of like the chair runs the SREC. And then he's also run for the legislature, which shows he knows the importance of holding Republicans accountable when they fail to deliver, okay? So he jumps in and he jumps in with the support of Chairman Matt Rinaldi, the support of Attorney General Ken Paxton, the support of more SREC members than anyone else, the, cons the biggest conservative block of SREC members, and then a lot of your conservative legislators who are both in and then incoming. And so Abraham George ends up, uh, really he and Dana Myers are the two main candidates from day one. Dana Myers was the sitting vice chair of the Republican Party. She was the one who started out with the strongest block of support. She actually primaried Matt Rinaldi. She announced her campaign at the TFRW convention to take out Matt Rinaldi. She wanted to unseat him, but she started with a block, a block of kind of anti-Rinaldi individuals, and then also just people she had met throughout the state. I mean, I met people at convention, some people who I know very well, who are good conservative people say, well, I think I'm gonna go with Dana Myers, okay? So not every one of her votes was a moderate, person who didn't like Rinaldi, but that was definitely a base of her support. And so she had the largest block of support. Abraham George jumped in and then he had a block of support. Uh, before he did, uh, both Ben Armenta and Weston Martinez also primaried Rinaldi. So meaning they, I say primaried because that's kind of how we say it, but you wouldn't really, it's not a primary in a general. So just say they challenged. So Ben Armenta and Weston Martinez also announced campaigns running against Rinaldi. So the three of those individuals who are running for chair run to unseat the sitting chair, right? They want a new chair from what we currently have. When Matt Rinaldi drops out, then you have Abraham George who announces, and then he gets a block of this. So this probably relatively quickly puts him into a second place position under Dana Myers. Um, and I can say from all the data I looked at and everything else, like Abraham George was relatively consistently in this kind of second place position under Dana, um, very close, right? And as the convention got closer, I think he started to edge her out 
as his support built and grew um, and gave him a base, okay? And then you had Weston Martinez, Ben Armenta, Matt McCoviak, and Mike Garcia. Um, Amy Hedke is also somebody who decided to run at convention, made a speech. Um, she was a little bit of a non-factor in general of the race. Now, there were some SDs where she got more votes than Matt McCoviak and Ben Armenta, but you know, Amy, if, if you know Amy, she's a longtime grassroots activist. So there are certain Senate districts where there's like eight or nine or 10 people that just love that lady and will vote for her if she runs for something. So she ran at the convention though. I don't think anybody saw her as as much of a serious individual in the race. Okay, that's not an offense to Amy, great lady. Okay, so it's a crowded field. If you knew past conventions, you would know like we, a three-way race is a crowded state chair race, okay? A seven-way race is like unheard of. You just don't deal with this. So the SREC and the Rules Committee ended up selecting a rather tedious process to vote. I think ultimately it was the right thing to do. Um, I think as we look at future conventions, we might not enact this rule. Uh, or maybe it was the right thing to do just for the chair race, but not for all the other races. They basically required sequential votes with the bottom individual being dropped off, okay? What that meant was you'd vote for seven chair candidates, the last place finisher would drop, or the, and then you would vote again. And people would start to uh, vote for the top two or three candidates as, as time went on, okay? Now, what happens in that situation is you end up having a more pure selection process in the Senate districts. Okay. They really are able to wrestle through this massive menu of different people's visions that they see. Where if you do the top two, honestly, it might be the case where the third place finisher would actually end up winning if some of these votes fell the, you know, fell uh, in a sequential manner. And so you just give the Senate district time to make sure this is the actual selection of your Senate district. Took a little longer for those of us in the room, but I think it was best for the chair race. I don't know if it was necessary for all the other races, um, so that's what I think we should really take seriously as we look at the next convention. We come in and these ballots start getting cast Friday morning. And Abraham George wins 13 of the Senate districts. Dana Myers wins six. Weston Martinez won six. Mike Garcia won two. I'm doing this from memory, so I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Um, I believe Ben Armenta won one and Matt McCoviak won one. Um, not Forgive me if I'm off by one, but I think it was 13, six, six, two, one, one. Now, if you don't win three Senate districts, you actually can't go get nominated from the floor. There's a state nominations committee. They all go, they all vote their Senate districts, and then they wrestle it out to see if the committee is gonna select somebody with a majority of the Senate districts, because nobody won 16. So several people said, hey, we think it's clear that Abraham George is the selection of the convention as a whole, so we're gonna place his name into nominations, okay? So several of them voted for him on the second round. I know this gets kind of complicated if you're following it along, but I'm trying to explain to you how this worked. He went from 13 to 16 votes on the second round of voting in the state nominations committee. Every Senate district sends one guy to the committee and they vote. So he gets placed forward as the nominee. He won 13 Senate districts and then got three more in the committee when they voted. And then we go to the floor. Now, at that point in time, it was relatively clear that conservatives had rallied around Abraham. And I will say this, Abraham more than any other candidate was being attacked. He was being attacked more than anybody else by far. From text messages that were hitting every other day to articles that were getting written to individuals who were posting on social media, no candidate. I would actually venture to say that most of these candidates combined did not get the type of criticism that Abraham George got, okay? So the rest of these candidates are running with a little bit of criticism here and there. Probably the second most was Dana Myers. So there was some concerted efforts given to kind of call out Dana for donations to Texans for lawsuit reform, donations to Associated Republicans of Texas and other more moderate groups, okay? The balloting starts and it's clear. The delegates are saying, we like the direction the Texas GOP is going. We like the focus on the grassroots. We want to hold these Republicans accountable if they don't do the right thing. We want Abraham George. And at that point, there was an op there, I felt like there was this window where people could start to come together. Um, but instead, every single candidate 
that dropped out who endorsed, endorsed Dana Myers. Okay? I don't believe Emmy Hedke endorsed anybody, but Ben Armenta, Mike Garcia, Matt Makoviak, and Weston Martinez all ended up endorsing Dana Myers for chair. In an effort to try to, at that point, it seems like it's an effort to stop Abraham George more than Dana Myers, but I don't, they, I don't, I'm not going to speak to the motivations of the individuals, but they got involved and they all tried to help Dana Myers get across the finish line. Now, in a normal election process, that kind of unification would put vault Dana Myers into the winning position. But the votes get cast and Abraham George wins 54% and Dana Myers gets 46%. We were there on the floor and Abraham George's votes, all of his voters, I will compliment them in saying that they did a great job not celebrating a single thing until they actually won the race, okay? And this just happens. Senate districts are calling out and one Senate district will go George and one will go Myers. And there's this opportunity to go, yeah, and start yelling and screaming, but they didn't. They were focused on that. And one of the other things I will say is that this is just goes back to this large takeaway from the convention. Guys, if you were on the floor, you would have seen conservatives organizing and coming together. And the amount, I mean, I had so many Mike Garcia voters I know that just came up and said, hey, I voted for Mike, I'm all in for Abraham, we need to make sure we have a conservative who's leading the party, right? Hey, I voted for Weston Martinez, but I'm voting for Abraham because we need to make sure we have a grassroots conservative fighting for the party. Um, I even had people I met that said, oh, well, I knew Ben Armenta, I, I've met him at this instance, but I'm gonna go with Abraham. And that happened because a lot of you, conservative grassroots people, were actually working the convention, okay? I got texts from people who between the first and second ballot while all of the candidates are endorsing Dana Myers, they're like looking to their neighbor next to him and just saying, hey, look, Abraham's won the last couple of rounds. Can you just vote with him on the last round to unify us? Yeah, I'll do that. And this is a Dana Myers voter who voted for Dana, 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 Abraham at the end, right? And so it was individuals. It, it, sometimes you think, oh, well, if I'm, if I'm just one guy, I'm not making a difference. But like, this was a mass movement. There were Abraham George voters waiting outside between the first and the second round of voting in the chair race because they lock the doors when you vote. And so they open the doors and all these people rush in, get their seats so that the last round of voting that's just Abraham versus Dana, they're in their seats to be able to cast an Abraham George vote, okay? He got selected by Senate districts across the state of Texas. We had Republican leaders, county chairs, SREC members, grassroots organization leaders, special groups, elected state representatives on the floor, uh, representatives elect, people who won their Republican primary, who were on the floor working people, left and right, saying we have to come together. Why? Because immediately following that convention, after Abraham was elected and Dorinda Randall as his vice chair, who's a conservative lawyer, and then Debbie Georgiades as Republican National Committee woman. Three days later, we're gonna win a bunch of races, which I talked about last week. And now the Republican Party of Texas is the one coming out with this message, hey, Let's select the Republican speaker in the Republican caucus. Let's get rid of Democrat chairs. Let's make sure the Democrats don't choose the next speaker. Now, if, if somebody who's literally saying, I wanna pull back from how much pressure we're putting on the legislature is elected as chair, they're not going to hold these people accountable. They're gonna, it's not that they will come out and back them, it's that they will just be silent on election day, Abraham George and Dorinda Randall put out a fantastic statement. And I read it last week, but they said, now's the time that we need to come together and not work with Democrats. That statement alone is only something that would come out of an administration in the George Dorinda Randall administration, who is set to not only grow the party and make sure we're putting our message out there, but also to make sure that we're not teaming up with Democrats to select leadership that will determine the vision for the policy directives of the state of Texas. That's what this is about. And the Texas GOP chair race was about that, whether we're gonna close our primaries. See, several of the candidates, uh, Weston Martinez, Mike Garcia, and Abraham George said, I will defend this closed primary rule in court. And Matt Makoviak said we should close our primaries, but didn't say whether he'd defend the rule change in court. Ben Armenta said he was, 
either against closed primaries or for it legislatively, but thought it was problematic. I don't remember all the details there. And then Dana Myers said, I support closed primaries, but she would not explicitly say whether she would defend it in court. And see, this is the type of thing that delegates saw through. Imagine if you're like, we just closed the primary by rule, and I elected this person as chair who told me they support closing the Republican primary, and then we get sued, and the chairman goes, you know what, I'm just not sure we're gonna pursue this, I'm not gonna go to court. And the court says, okay, great, then we're gonna actually overturn, we're, we're not gonna let you close the primaries. All of a sudden, that person who said they supported closed primaries, quote unquote, isn't actually showing up to make sure to defend the rule in court. So that's the type of thing the delegates saw and the organization that took place. Now I wanna close by saying, again, this doesn't mean that everybody who supported Dana Myers is forever a bad person who wants the party to move in the wrong direction. There's a lot of them that have already said, let's come together and push the party forward. And that's what our message should be. Our message to every Republican there is, you can jump on board and we can together advance our platform, our legislative priorities, the conservative rules, and make the Republican Party an institution, continue to sustain it as an institution that advances conservative principles and policies in the state. I'm really proud of the grassroots who stood up and elected Abraham George as chairman of the Republican Party of Texas. I'm really grateful for so many of you who didn't vote for him in the first place, but came around and or even after the election said, let's come back together. And that is our message. We're coming back together and we're uniting. And there are some few Republican legislators and individuals in the party who are gonna to continue to try to divide us and are gonna to continue to try to make it okay to work with Democrats, but we're not gonna let that happen. We're gonna keep pushing and the victories that we had, you should be encouraged by and it should cause you to get even more engaged over the next two years. May God bless you and may God bless the great state of Texas. Do you wanna get your news from people who share your values? Texas Scorecard, real news for real Texans.